Welcome to a very normal Therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll talk about probability distributions. We'll talk about what they are, why they're important, and we'll use a little bit of code along the way. These are the main concepts and ideas we'll use throughout the video. At the end, we'll weave each of them into a simple mental map. The world is a random place. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Sometimes your Uber driver talks to you, and other times they'll talk to you even when you paid a little extra for them not to say anything. We'll define randomness as the presence of uncertainty, or even better, the absence of predictability. Randomness means that no matter how hard you try, you can't perfectly predict what will happen next. This unpredictability kind of sucks. Our brains are hardwired to search for patterns, and it doesn't take much to convince us that something is happening when it actually isn't. Think of lucky streaks in the casino or the supposed hot hand in basketball. Our pattern-finding brain sees these trends and believes that some force is causing these things to happen. In reality, both of these things are just a string of random events that we interpret to be non-random. This brings up a problem. If we could see patterns in the world that actually aren't there, how do we distinguish these illusions from actual trends that exist? Statisticians use mathematical models to impose structure on this randomness. To understand what I mean by structure, we need to understand the probability distribution. But before we get to that, we need to learn about the random variable. One of the basic elements of a statistical model is the random variable. If you were to read about random variables in a textbook, you would see that a random variable is a function. This function takes elements in a sample space of an event and outputs a number. That's it. There are more formal definitions of a random variable, but those definitions aren't that helpful to us statisticians. Instead, we'll ground our understanding in a few examples. As a first example, let's say that we're playing a game of Catan, a board game that's been the source of a lot of bitterness in my life. You don't need to understand the rules of Catan, only that the main source of randomness in the game is the roll of two six-sided die. After you roll, you take the sum of the two die. The outcome of the sum decides whether or not you get resources, which lets you do stuff in the game. This matrix shows the possible sums from the two dice. We can see that their sum can range from 2 to 12, and due to randomness, we can't know which one we'll see ahead of time. Some of you may already see which sums are more likely and which ones aren't. We'll get to that. As a second example, let's say the thing I want to observe is the hours of watch time that this YouTube channel gets in a day. Hours is the measure of time, so the range of possible values is, theoretically, infinite. But only infinite in the positive direction. As a final example, let's say that the thing I want to observe is whether or not you finish this YouTube video. Since I know you will, the only value this random variable can take is 1, which is the number I use to represent that idea. Theoretically, some of you won't finish the video, so this random variable might also be 0, but that won't happen, right? The central takeaway is that the random variable is a mathematical representation of something in the world that can take a range of numerical values, but we can't predict what value we'll see in advance. These values can be discrete, as we saw in the first and third example, or continuous, as we saw in the second example. You'll need to be familiar with a bit of notation. When a random variable is a capital letter, we are conveying that this object can take on different values. When we see a lowercase version of that same letter, we've actually observed a value from the random variable. It's no longer random since we've actually observed it. We now know that a random variable can take on different values, but just knowing the range of values isn't that useful. We might also be interested in knowing how likely we are to see these different values relative to each other. For example, in Catan, there is a map of hexagons, and most of these hexagons have numbers on them. If you have property on a hexagon, you can collect resources, but only if the sum of the dice matches the number on that hexagon. Therefore, it's in your best interest to build properties on hexagons with numbers that are more likely to come up. Otherwise, you're just sitting there eating Doritos while everyone else is gathering sheep. To be more precise, what we want is a function. This function will take in a number and output another number. This output number will describe to us how likely we are to see the input number. If the output is higher, that means that we're more likely to observe that input number. If the output is zero, then we can interpret this as it being impossible to observe that particular input. Luckily, all random variables have such a function, which we refer to as the probability distribution. It can also be called the probability density function, or PDF, or probability mass function, PMF, depending on if the values we observe are continuous or discrete. From here on out, I'll use the phrase probability distribution, and I'll denote this function with the lowercase f. The probability distribution is important because it describes the structure and the randomness in a random variable. To understand what I mean by this, let's look at the probability distribution of the sum of the double dice roll. The distribution takes on this triangle shape. When many people think of randomness, 
they think of this. This randomness is chaotic, totally unpredictable. By looking at the entire function, you can see which values are likely and which aren't. If you want to win in Catan, choose hexagons with an 8 or a 9. If you want to have a bad time, choose 2 or 12. Some of you may have noticed this, but I've avoided using the word probability to describe the output of a probability distribution. That word does apply in the case of the PMF, you can get a probability from both point values and ranges of values. If you want to get a probability from a PDF, you can only talk about that in terms of ranges of values. If you take a point value from a PDF, it's not a probability. It's technically a probability density. It can still tell us that one value is more or less likely than another, but it's not a probability. Even though it's impossible to predict values in a random variable ahead of time, the probability distribution tells us that, over many observations, the frequency that they appear will be predictable. And that's what I mean by structure. It's worth mentioning there is an alternative way to describe the structure of randomness in a random variable. It's a close cousin to the probability distribution, and it's called the cumulative distribution function, or CDF. Note that the D in PDF and the D in CDF aren't the same word. Like the PDF and PMF, the CDF takes in a number and outputs a particular kind of probability. The CDF gets its name from the fact that it outputs a cumulative probability the probability that a random variable will be less or equal to a given value. We usually denote the CDF with an uppercase F. Many people prefer to work with the probability distribution, but the CDF enjoys the benefit of always outputting a probability. The CDF conveys the exact same information as the PDF, but it just takes some effort to see. I'll demonstrate here with the double dice roll example since this relationship is easier to see with discrete random variables. The CDF of a double dice roll looks like this. CDFs of discrete random variables always take on this staircase appearance. For reference, we'll also have the PMF to the side. Before the number 2, the CDF always outputs a value of 0. But well, once we reach 2, it jumps to 136. When we get to 3, we jump to 336. At this point, we need to add the probabilities of the sum being 2 and the sum being 3, since we're outputting a cumulative probability. Therefore, the jumps of the CDF indicate how much probability is allocated to that number. Let's talk about the connection between probability and statistics. They're very often paired together, but the distinction between them is not always made clear. When people first start learning about probability distributions, they're grounded in real-world examples like the dice I mentioned. These are good for picking up the concept of random variables, but I feel like it doesn't help explain why we statisticians would bother to learn about them. Let me ask, what are the random variables we deal with in statistics? The first major one is the data set. Data is a really general term, but I'll define it as just observed information in numerical form. A data set is just a collection of observed random variables, really. A data set is observed, so we usually denote it like this. The number of observations, or sample size, is usually denoted with an n. And if we're just talking about the general idea of a data set, it would look like this. But we don't collect data just to do nothing with it. The sample size n could be really large, so we often want to summarize the information contained in the dataset into a single value. This single value is called a statistic. For some reason, statistics are often denoted with the capital T. If you know why, let me know in the comments. A statistic is simple. It takes a data set of n observations and outputs a single number. There are many common statistics that we care about and learn about in statistics classes. The sample mean, the sample variance, they're all functions of data that produce a single number, and they have meaning that's relevant to the data. There are many other interesting statistics other than these, so it's helpful to have a general definition to cover all of them. In probability, you learn that a function of random variables is also a random variable. Since a statistic is a function of data, then a statistic is also a random variable. This can be potentially confusing because many times we only ever collect one data set and by extension only ever see one sample statistic in the end. So how could it be random? You just need to think about what happens when you collect another data set. It's very unlikely that that second data set will produce the exact same value for the statistic. If statistics are all random variables, then by extension, they also have probability distributions. And this is a foundational piece of knowledge in statistics that's often missed by beginning students. If you internalize this, it makes other concepts like hypothesis testing much easier to understand. Before we wrap up this video, we'll do a little code demonstration. Let's say that I'm a tryhard at Catan. When I play Catan, I want to destroy my opponents. To be able to do this, I'm going to use R to simulate the game and test out different strategies. 
I would like to know the number of times I would expect to see different sums over the course of an entire game of Catan. For simplicity, I'll stick to the number 8, but you can repeat this for other numbers. I read in an interesting blog post that the average game of Catan is about 70 dice rolls, so my data set is going to be 70 double dice rolls, which I'll simulate in R. To simulate a double dice roll, I'll randomly generate two numbers from 1 to 6. To get these to be integers, I'll round up. I'm assuming that an average game of Catan is 70 dice rolls, so I need to repeat this process 70 times. After simulating all those dice rolls, I count the number of 8s among these rolls, which turns out to be 10 in this case. That was just one data set and one statistic. To demonstrate that this statistic has a distribution, I need to replicate this experiment many times, so I'll repeat it 10,000 times. This code here does just that. Now that it's done running, let's look at the histogram for the sum statistic. The histogram is actually an estimate of the probability distribution. And there we have it. You can see that this count statistic takes on a range of different values. It almost looks like a normal distribution, even though the distribution of the original dice roll is triangular. The peak of this probability distribution looks to be around 13 or 14, so let's check. In an average Catan game of 70 dice rolls, we'll see about 14 eights on average. Knowing that, I can try to shift my strategies to work around this number somehow. You can find this code on GitHub, and I've also put a link in the description. To wrap up this video, let's develop a map that relates all the concepts we learned. It won't be a complete picture, but it can help jumpstart your own mental model for these concepts. Randomness in the world is the presence of uncertainty and prevents us from predicting future events with perfect accuracy. We represent this idea with a random variable. To understand what values are more or less likely, we use a probability distribution. This is a function that takes in a possible value that a random variable can take and outputs a number that expresses how likely we are to see it. In other words, it describes the structure and the randomness in the random variable. Depending on whether or not the random variable is discrete or continuous, it can have another name, the probability mass function or the probability density function. There's another function that describes the structure of randomness, the cumulative distribution function, or CDF. This function outputs a probability that a random variable will be less than or equal to a given value. In statistics, the most common random variable we deal with are data and statistics. An observed data set is just a collection of observed random variables, while a statistic is a function of data that produces a number. Sample mean and variance are classic examples of statistics that we deal with. This has been a very normal therapeutics training video on probability distributions. Now get back to work or you're fired.